Hello everyone, welcome to another video. It's Francesco here. I hope everyone's doing really well. And uh, today we've got a really exciting piece. Uh, we're going to be talking specifically to March Rogers from the OneNote team. We're gonna ask him a few awesome questions about design, covering the topics that we think uh, will be interesting for you guys to listen to about productivity, the future of OneNote, and really delving into a few nuggets like that. So, uh, brilliant to have you here, March. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time out. Uh, and it's the morning there, right? Yeah, that's right. It's, a, it's about 9.30 in the morning, and I'm uh, delighted to be here. Thanks for inviting me. No worries. Um, could you first maybe explain a bit about your role in the OneNote team to kick things off? Sure. I've been the design director at OneNote for the last couple of years. Uh, and so we're, um, we're a small team of about 15 designers uh, who are focused on OneNote on all the different platforms that we ship our apps on. So pretty much every platform that people want to use where we have an app for that. Brilliant, brilliant. Now, I was talking to March just before we started and he was saying it's his first ever uh, interview, but um, he's, he's going to go into the design stuff, which is great. So I guess uh, a few weeks ago, you guys re released a sort of uh, redesign, right, of the new OneNote experience. Maybe yeah, that's tell us a little more, right, about that sort of uh, launch. Maybe more about how you launched it, uh, what are the new functions and features that you think people will enjoy in the new experience? Yeah, for sure. So um, I'll give you a little bit of background about why we made these changes. One of the things that's important for us, both sort of as designers, but also as people who feel responsible to our customers who use the products every day, is not to make changes just for the sake of making changes. We want to make sure anytime that we're going to make a significant change to the app that there's good reasons to do it. Um, so for us, that sort of the, the latest redesign, the spark for it came uh, about a year ago. So OneNote's been out on the market for about 13 years and it's been used as a sort of personal note-taking tool for you know, millions of people over the course of that time. But uh, we started noticing a new trend a couple of years ago, which is that uh, in K through 12 classrooms, so that's like age, students age five to up to age 18, we saw more and more of those classrooms starting to have uh, either tablets or PCs uh, showing up, uh, one on every desk for the, for the students. And what, one of the things that really the teachers discovered was that OneNote made a great sort of digital binder. Um, and so it was something that they could use to organize uh, all of the homework for the kids, the quizzes they have to take, any assignments. And it became basically the sort of digital equivalent of that paper three ring binder that the teacher used to organize and that each of the students used to carry in their backpacks. And so um, as we started to see that usage of OneNote, which was, we were obviously very excited about, and we had to learn a lot about you know, what were the needs of teachers and students in the classroom, uh, we started to see uh, some interesting challenges they had that, that sort of prompted us to want to um, improve the design of the product. And it really sort of fell into three categories. Uh, the first one was uh, the apps on different platforms were a little inconsistent in terms of the way the UI was laid out. They'd been made by uh, you know, different teams at different times. And it hadn't really been an issue until we started seeing classrooms where the teacher might be using a PC or a Mac, and they were very commonly... Uh, have their computer plugged into a projector and show something up on the big screen. And then the students were using either sort of low-end PCs or, or tablets, and they were using the web version very commonly. Mm. And the UI between those two was different. And so the teacher would point to something um, on the projector and say, go to that section, and that's where your homework is. And the kids would look down, and they would see something completely different. And education would grind to a halt, and the teacher would have to like go into tech support mode. And so that was clearly a problem we wanted to fix by making the apps appear consistent um, in, in the way that the navigation was laid out across all of the platforms. That was number one, consistency. Second one was that, you know, most people who were using OneNote as a, as a personal notebook have maybe, you know, two or three notebooks and each notebook has maybe six or seven sections depending on how they use it. But what we noticed with teachers and students was they wanted to create a, a, what we call a section group, uh, which is like a folder with sections in it. Yeah. For each student, that the teacher and the student would have access to that um, to that uh, section group, and it would contain their homework and their quizzes and all the personal notes for that student. And you know, most classrooms have somewhere between twenty five and thirty five, maybe even forty students in it. So suddenly, these notebooks got really big and and uh, a lot of sections in them. And our current navigation sort of didn't scale as well as it could to that to those size of notebooks, and you could get a little disoriented and like which which pocket of the of the notebook have I gone down into? And so we really wanted to fix that so that it would scale well and that people could stay oriented and understand where they were in the notebook at, at any given time. 
And then the third part is that what we discovered is teachers share a value that, that we have at Microsoft here around accessibility. And uh, what we really found was that for teachers, if they were considering adopting a technology into the classroom, if it excluded even one student, then that was a deal breaker for them and they wouldn't want to do it at all. And so that became really clearly important for us to make sure that our app was accessible as possible. And that's for people who are using screen readers or, or using high contrast mode or maybe using a keyboard only or a switch or some sort of assistive technology in order to be able to access the app. We wanted to make sure that they had not uh, that a they could use it and and our goal was that they have a first class experience that they weren't sort of second class citizens in the app just because they were using one of those assistive technologies so that was it that was these three big things we wanted it to be consistent across platforms we wanted it to be scalable to these really big notebooks and we wanted it to be accessible to everyone who wanted to use the product and that was our starting point then for like okay now we have some problems that we think are worth solving and then how are we going to go solve them definitely that's, that's brilliant here and and i i guess with um the sort of student side of stuff, it's it's really important that they have that consistent experience, as you were saying, because you know there's nothing worse than a teacher having to run around the classroom with tech support, right? Uh, Absolutely, they hate it. Yeah, they do. <laughs> uh, and and with with that topic of sort of case studies, I guess, uh -huh. is there any sort of uh, recent case studies that you've had with the new experience where you've had uh, users that have like really enjoyed it uh, in terms of their OneNote usage or even past ones that have sort of blown you away with people using OneNote. Sure, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about a, a couple. Uh, some of this is sort of baked into our user-centered design process, like how we make products. So basically it sort of boils down to, we try and find problems that are worth solving for our customers. We come up with possible solutions to see if they solve those problems and then we test it to see if it works. And so for some sort of simple features, we can do that pretty quickly. You know, we can sketch out some ideas. We can come up with something that works. We do a quick usability study with maybe, you know, five or 10 people. And then we can roll out, you know, a flight of that feature to maybe 5% of our users and, and get feedback. For something like the kind of change that we were making uh, for the recent redesign, it's a really big change to how, you know, the app is laid out and to how people are used to using it. And so we wanted to have really good confidence that we had we gotten it right. And so after we went through what we would call sort of our normal design process where we sketch out ideas, we create prototypes, we show them to users, we do a small scale usability, we wanted to get into what we call longitudinal research, which is where we, we want to see people using it day to day for a few months at a time and see how do they adjust to it. You know, because maybe on the first day, it's a little confusing, but then how quickly do they get used to it and, and does it actually be better than the older version? So we did this by recruiting um, uh, 12 different classrooms in three different countries. And basically we, we sort of worked with the teachers um, who are one, you know, huge advocates for their students and also enthusiastic about any technology that could potentially make the classroom experience more effective. And so we were able to talk to them and say, hey, how would, how would you like to have a, a sort of module in your classroom where the students get to see what is it like to, to design a, a big uh, global scale product? And we'll code it with them. And so we sort of created a little curriculum. Um, mostly these are uh, fifth through eighth grade classes. So maybe, you know, eight-year-olds up to about 13-year-olds sort of just happened to be that sweet spot for us. And we did this in the U.S., Canada, and Australia. And uh, we basically went and we set, you know, these classrooms up, you know, 20, 30 kids with uh, a prototype version of the design. And then, you know, Skyped with them once a week, had them fill out surveys for us and really give, you know, give us their feedback. One uh, great thing, which is new for me, um, uh, sort of having a, a target audience who are children, is they are 100% honest. Uh, yeah. they're, they're extremely blunt with their feedback and they're extremely enthusiastic with their feedback as well. Uh, and so it was very clear that there was things we needed to improve, which we did. We refined with them things that we had either missed or not understood in terms of how they wanted to use it, and mostly ab about flexibility. They wanted to be able to control how, how much of the navigation they could see on the screen at any given time and how much space it took up, because it obviously takes up some space away from the, the content page. And so we went back and forth with them for several months until we got to a place where we were pretty confident then that we had sort of ironed out all of the kinks. And by the end of that, we had a lot of teachers who, you know, the thing that was sort of a, a, a good sign for us was that the teachers have to teach the kids how to use OneNote. Mm. And the redesign that we had done had made it easier for them to teach the kids. 
And when they went on a break, like they went on their Christmas break or they or, or their spring break, when they came back, it was they had forgotten less about how to use the product. And so that's always a concern is you have to teach them again and again and again how to use these products. And so um, and so they found that it was easier to, to understand and it was easier to learn and easier to remember. So that was great on the teacher side. And then on um, the student side, you know, they, they care about getting in and out as quickly as possible, right? Like they didn't come to school to use OneNote. They came to school to uh, hopefully learn and honestly play with and hang out with their friends. And so we want to make sure that we're as seamless and easy a product to use as possible. And so we just focused on making sure that um, it was just effortless for them to navigate around the notebooks and get done what they wanted to do. And they respond really positively to things like, you know, really colorful uh, UI and the designs and shapes and fun features. We have a lot of sort of fun ink features, yeah. uh, which if you want, I can give you a second example, one of those case studies of how we work, particularly how we've learned to work with students in our design process. Yeah, sure. Yeah, feel free to go into that. Uh, so as well as these big scale you know, we're changing the way the navigation works. We have to be really thorough about it. We're taking months to do the research and refinement. But that's not the only way that we work. And it's pretty common for us that we will go into classrooms uh, with kids to do visits to understand how they're working and, you know, uh, and to observe. And then at the end of it, uh, we'll, we'll say, we'll stand up at the front of the class and, and ask the students, if you had a magic wand and OneNote could do anything for you, what would you want it to do? And they just shout out the things that they think are fun. One of the ones that we heard uh, sort of late last year was a, a, a nine-year-old uh, girl in, in a school close to here uh, in Bellevue, and she shouted out, Rainbow Ink! <laughs> <laughs> this is never we've thought about that at all. You know, I mean, if you, OneNote has had inking capabilities for a while, but it's like black and blue and green, right? Just pretty standard colors. Uh, and she shouted out Rainbow Ink, and the entire class cheered, and we're like, sold. Okay, that's, that's the feature right there. I don't, you don't need a stronger signal than that. So we went and figured out, like, how do you do rainbow ink? And then we're like, well, once we know how to do rainbow ink, we're like, well, let's do glitter ink and let's do silver and let's do gold. And we, went, we literally went back to the, that classroom, that same group of kids with the prototype and said, what do you think? And they, they just, they loved it. And, and um, so we rolled it out and it's become a feature. And actually one is called Galaxy, uh, which uses public domain uh, Hubble telescope photos of, of actual galaxies oh, as wow. part of the pattern. And that's turned out to be the, the favorite one. And we, we uh, on, on Twitter and on Facebook, we're, we're friends with a bunch of teachers who sort of share and give us feedback. Uh, they keep posting these screenshots of the kids' homework written entirely in these like rainbow. Oh and that's galaxy. Uh, so yeah, that was, that was really fun. And that's, you know, it's, so on the one hand, we have these very thorough user-centered design processes focused on big, hard problems like accessibility, like consistency. And then we also do things that are sort of fun because you know, an eight-year-old thought it was a good idea and, and we followed her lead. Oh, yeah, definitely. That's amazing. That's such a good story. You're, you're sort of so glad that they didn't shout out one note so that it can do your homework for you, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, that would be tough. Right? <laughs> that would be tough. We, uh, we do get those requests. And, and what was interesting for us was that uh, one of the things that uh, Microsoft has, because of just the sort of technologies that we build, we always look for what are the technologies that already exist inside the company that we could make use of in, in the most effective way. And we have a team that um, has basically spent a long time developing uh, software that does math very well, does math very well. And, uh, and we thought, well, we could put this into OneNote for if this would be helpful. But we went to some math teachers and said, is this, is this actually good? Would you want this in the product? Is this just letting the, t the students cheat and learn the work if it auto completes their equations for them? Yeah. And we're like, no, 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 it's actually, we, that's what we do on the, on the, on the blackboard or the whiteboard all the time is we yeah. go through the equations and go through them over and over and over again and sort of explain how they work. It's not, you know, they're not trying to teach the kids how to be calculators. They're trying to teach the kids how to understand why does this mathematics do what it does? And this is like, geometry and uh, algebra and calculus. And so we, uh, we added this capability and we basically co-designed this with four different math teachers where uh, you could write in an equation uh, using a pen and ink, uh, let's say a quadratic equation, and then the system would recognize it and it would show you how to solve it, but it would, the, the, the sort of innovation that the teacher suggested mm -hmm. was not that it just shows you the answer, but it goes through step by step by step Oh, this is how you, you simplify the equation and this is how you solve for X and this is what that means. And then we just added a capability to graph it as well so they could start to see what does that mean, a quadratic equation or algebra, 
What does that look like when you're talking about points in space? And so these sorts of features, which honestly, you know, I'm not a math expert at all. And so we rely heavily on these amazing teachers who are just, you know, are passionate about trying to make these products better with us uh, to try and understand uh, what's going to be useful. And in that case, we were pretty confident uh, the assurance is the math teacher that we weren't just uh, letting the program do the kids' homework for them. Yeah, that's it. But that that's really good though, because like you can bring in these sort of functions that you've already applied to other situations in Microsoft, right? And you're really, and you might not have known that was a problem, but now it is something that can be solved. So it's really good. And sort of on that topic, where do you see uh, OneNote evolving to over the next five years? Yeah, it's a good question, and um, we we definitely have some some themes and goals that we're we're striving towards. We think are really promising. I'll, I'll talk about them. It's also worth noting that because we have this sort of iterative feedback process with our customers, um, honestly, it's going to be a journey with us and our customers to see you know what's valuable and and what can we bring. Um, I, there's a couple of themes that I'll talk about. One of them is. Um, one of the places that we've discovered OneNote seems to resonate with people the most is when they're having some sort of big life moment. Um, and this might be a new job. Uh, sometimes it can be we're having a baby. Sometimes it can be um, we're, we're planning to remodel our house. Sometimes it can be scary things like there's a medical diagnosis in the family that we have to deal with um, or uh, we're, you know, everything is about to change in our lives for one reason or another. And what all of those moments have uh, in common is out of the blue, I have to learn, I have to learn a huge amount of new information about something that I didn't know anything about before. I often have to do that with the people who matter most to me in my life. So we have to do it together, me, my wife, maybe, you know, my parents, maybe my children, we have to sort of gather this information together. And then um, we have to, we have to be able to understand it and, and act on it. And so in that case where, you know, you basically have all, all this information, and this is, you know, the example of somebody who's having a baby, uh, you know, people just go on the internet and they're just consuming huge amounts of information and articles and they're reading books, right? And it can be very overwhelming, but they feel like it really matters to them. And so what we started seeing people do is capture those things, the insights and the things they need to learn inside OneNote, which allows them to organize it and, you know, put together lists and reminders and things, share that with people who matter most to them in their lives. And then, you know, in that, in that case, OneNote sort of did something really powerful for them. And then they start to understand, oh, I could use this for other life moments. You know, maybe I did it for, um, for a medical diagnosis for our family, but now I could do the same thing for planning a vacation, right? Or for, you know, helping my son apply to go to college, things like that. And so those, that theme of life moments of like where it really matters, where the rubber hits the road and how can technology help you in those moments is something that uh, OneNote already is used for, and we think we can make it better and better in that way. Mm. The second one is that OneNote has, you know, for a while been trying to make itself more and more intelligent. And so, you know, as machine learning is developing, both within the company and in the industry in general, we're looking for more and more opportunities to do that. So OneNote already can recognize your handwriting. Mm. Um, record audio notes inside it, we can already uh, listen to the audio and transcribe it for you. Mm -hmm. um, and we already can, if you, if you put in photos that have text inside the photos, so for example, if you were at a conference and you snapped some photos with your phone of the slides, we can recognize the text inside the slides. And one, we can translate that into text if you want, but we can also just make it all searchable. And so this, you know, it's, it's been a theme in, in one for a while to be able to understand your content so that we can do something more useful for you. Mm -hmm. Up until now, the thing that we can do is we can save you time in transcribing stuff and we can help you find things again later through searching. But we'd like to be able to do more. Um, and, and that's going to be an evolving journey as we are able to understand more about what machine learning is able to do and what people want it to do. But we definitely have a theme that over time, uh, we want your notebook to get smarter. And the phrase I use is, you always want to use a machine that you put you know, a quarter in and you get a dollar back out. right? So you just get much more value out than the effort that you put in. And, um, and so we want to have it so that if you put some simple notes in your notebook and we do something with that to make it much more valuable to you, where that's not mm -hmm. only that searchable later, but we could pull in other content that you didn't know uh, that to, to go find as part of your research, for example. We could do the auto research for you. Um, we could help with things like translation, uh, so you could pull in sources other than your native language. And we could even start to show you patterns and insights inside of all the information that you've gathered that maybe you hadn't seen. Those are just some of the ideas. So um, yeah. we help you in those big life moments when it really matters. And then how can we use the burgeoning intelligence that's happening in technology to make it more useful? Definitely.
I think that's really the way forward with uh, the sort of content inside of stuff. And that sort of leads me on to my next question with the role of like AI. How do you see that playing into one there? I mean, you touched on it there. I guess like AI is a feature. Is there anything that you think it will correlate directly to inside the, the features? It's, it's interesting. I think, you know, we think about it on, on really three time horizons. And the short term is, is uh, you know, how can we automate sort of uh, tedious tasks? So, for example, if you record a lecture um, and you put that in OneNote, it would be nice not to have to type it all out, you know, listening to it in order to be able to use those notes. So that sort of um, uh, automatic uh, translation and transcription and stuff, I think, is something that that um, AI, today's AI, is actually really good at, right? Like, it can do these automated tasks that are pretty structured and well understood. So we're, doing, you know, we continue to invest in more of those things. Uh, there's a new feature um, in PowerPoint, actually, that we will probably bring to a lot of apps in the office suite, where if you insert a, uh, an image into a PowerPoint slide, um, we will use a machine learning algorithm to look at it and be able to create a text description of what that image is. And sophisticated, right? Like the ones that I have seen are things like, it's not just, oh, it's a picture of a cat. It's a picture of a white cat sitting on a green couch, for example. And... There's a couple of reasons for that. The, the most powerful one is that if your audience of that, um, of that presentation uh, uh, is blind, then this is a way for them to understand the, the presentation that you've had. And so you can make your content, not just your app, but you can make your content more accessible to anyone who you want to talk to. So those sorts of capabilities are going to become, I think, more commonplace uh, in the next few years. Uh, and then longer term, it's interesting. There's lots of we get very speculative at that point, and uh, I'm not talking about any specific features, but we're excited about AI as a collaborator um, mm -hmm. to help you with things like that. And again, I'll give you a sort of an example from, from a recent release of, of PowerPoints just because they, they happen to be doing this feature first, uh, which is if you throw all of your content into PowerPoint, your images, your text, whatever those things is, we can use a machine learning algorithm to say, mm, how would be the, what would be the best way to lay this out? Mm -hmm. And like a designer in the box, right? Like here's five different ways that you could lay out this presentation that makes sense based on the content that you have in here. Which one of those do you like? And so that idea of, of sort of an AI uh, system as a collaborator who can work with you to create something, uh, I think is probably the long-term uh, view that we would have of where AI is going. Definitely. That would be really, that would be really cool inside of OneNote, like a curation ability. Uh, just to make things format easier. That would be really wicked. Um, that's really great. Um, so they're, they're all the questions I had uh, for March. So I just wanted to thank March and the OneNote team for allowing me to speak to them about uh, all of these fantastic things that OneNote are doing and also more about the Microsoft OneNote experience. So thank you very much, March. Yeah, thank you very much, Francesca. This was really fun. Thanks for reaching out. Yeah, definitely. Thanks very much uh, to everyone uh, watching. Uh, everything will be in the description, any notes and information, and also how to follow the OneNote team on Twitter and also some other social networks. So feel free to check out all of those stuff in the description. Anyway, guys, thank you very much. Make sure to keep productive. Make sure to have a great day, and I'll see you guys very soon. Cheers.